Hi everyone, my name is Caitlin Mills. I'm a PhD candidate in biostatistics at the Keck School of Medicine at the University of Southern California. And today I'm going to talk about my work on characterizing the regulatory relationships of cell type specific enhancer gene links. So here's just a brief outline of what I'm going to cover today. We will start with a little background on the biology of the problem. Then I will introduce our enhancer gene link database, Peregrine. Then I will give a little bit of background on the machine learning aspect of the problem, after which I will discuss how we are using machine learning to create and validate cell type specific prediction models. Then I will talk about our plans to expand this approach to create a pooled model as a more powerful approach. Then I will touch on what we hope will be a good first application of this kind of information, which is to be able to incorporate this enhancer gene regulatory relationship information into the existing framework for pathway enrichment. jump right into the biology background related to this problem. So what is an enhancer? My project is focused on predicting the target genes of enhancers, so I always like to start off by defining what an enhancer is and what it does. In a nutshell, enhancers are stretches of DNA that activate transcription of their target gene to higher levels than would be the case in their absence. In this illustration, the enhancer is depicted by a blue stretch of DNA and the gene is in red. So here you can see the enhancer coming into physical proximity to the gene by way of transcription machinery represented by this green shape here. And this is how they regulate their target genes. So this is an illustration of, again, the enhancer as a stretch of DNA, as a DNA element coming into physical proximity to the gene, specifically its promoter here via transcriptional machinery. So when this mechanism occurs, there are a few things to consider namely that the enhancer does not need to be adjacent to the gene or even necessarily close to it for this to happen. The enhancer can be before the gene or after it. It can even be on another chromosome. The target gene, which is just any gene that the enhancer is directly, directly regulating, like in this picture, may be very near or very far from the enhancer. And enhancers can actually have multiple target genes. Genes can also be regulated by multiple enhancers. So this is a network of many-to-many -many relationships between the genes and the enhancers. So why do we care about enhancer gene links? Well, enhancers are an incredibly powerful component of our genome. They increase the transcription of the genes they regulate many times over and are vital regulatory elements that allow for tight control of gene expression by cell and tissue type. Ensuring that our cells are indeed very different depending on the tissue they are part of, despite every cell in our body having the exact same DNA. So they have a critical role in cell differentiation and maintenance of cellular identity. So maybe not surprisingly, when these regulatory links become disrupted, disease can follow as a result. Indeed, there's actually a class of disease called enhanceropathies, which occur when something goes wrong with enhancers. But enhancer misregulation is not just a characteristic of enhanceropathies. In fact, enhancers are associated with many more common and widely known diseases. You can see here from this pie chart of disease-associated variants from the National Human Genome Resource GWAS catalog that most disease-associated variants in the catalog lie within either intragenic or intergenic non-coding regions, which is where enhancers live, and that on the right, some common diseases are shown which clearly have a majority of significant SNPs lying in putative enhancer regions. So we know that there are a majority of significantly disease-associated GWAS variants that are in non-coding regions, and many of these are in enhancers. So this is just a close-up of a disease-associated variant from a GWAS, which is the dark SNP at the very top of the highlighted portion. And you can see that there are other SNPs in different colors according to how often they are co-inherited with the lead SNP versus how separated by recombination. And you can see that there are a lot of SNPs in linkage disequilibrium with the lead SNP, lots of red SNPs. And below, in the genomic viewer, you can see that in this region there are no genes, although there are genes nearby within a megabase or so on either side. But if you look at the genomic viewer, you can see that one of the selected tracks is layered H3K27 acetylation on seven cell lines and ENCODE. And that's just an epigenomic mark that is heavily associated with active enhancers. And there's really only one peak over on the right in teal, 
And the track below that is the DNA's hypersensitivity clusters, or hypersensitivity sites clustered over 125 cell types from ENCODE. And you can see that there is a dark bar that lines up with the teal peak. So that this could potentially be an enhancer because we would also expect it to probably reside within a DNA's hypersensitivity site. And when you look at all the SNPs, all of the RSIDs on this figure, you can see that there actually is one SNP that also perfectly overlaps with these signals. So if that were to be the true signal that the lead SNP is just denoting here as sort of flagging, and that SNP were in an enhancer, that would be a pretty good target to investigate if you're the scientist who's interested in the disease-associated variants in this GWAS. And so this actually happens a lot, where we find an interesting signal at the site of an enhancer, but what do we do with that information? Because the problem is that for most enhancers, we have no idea which genes they're regulating, which makes it very hard to determine how they could be contributing to the disease phenotype. So we need to get a better idea of which genes each enhancer regulates so that we can learn more about disease pathology and hopefully get to a point where this information can one day be used to develop new treatments. So there has been a lot of work put in over the years to try and determine the target genes of specific enhancers at the bench. And this is just the majority of the figures from one paper showing experimental evidence for a single enhancer gene link in liver cell lines. And this is not for you to really read through or examine closely, but just for me to try to convey how much time and effort it really is to do the experiments needed to determine these regulatory relationships. And then for us to remember that there are so many more enhancer gene relationships that are still undetermined. And so since this is a rather large problem, in terms of the number of enhancer gene links that are likely to exist between our 20,000 genes and roughly a million enhancers, there have been some high throughput efforts on the computational side to try and put together what we already know and see if that can give us hints to which genes may be regulated by which enhancers. I'm just showing two of the most current Enhancer Gene Link databases here, GeneHancer from GeneCards, and also Hacer. And so the way these databases work, we might want to look up a given enhancer, and we can query it and see all the different data these databases have compiled through publicly available data that could link the enhancer to genes, maybe through EQTL data, maybe through common transcription factor binding sites, or chromatin confirmation capture data, so on. Sometimes they predict just as a function of genomic distance. Uh, unfortunately, it's still really common for databases to generate enhancer gene links as a function of closest gene, or even all genes within 50 KB with no other supporting information, which while that probably does include some true links, it obviously includes a ton of false positives. So it's not an ideal approach. There's also a varying degree of transparency about how each enhancer gene link is generated when you download the bulk data from these databases, which is important because if I'm looking um, at an enhancer gene link that's supported by three wet lab experiments versus another that's really just listed because it happened to be the gene that was within 50 KB of the enhancer, I'd I would want to know that. That's a meaningful difference. And in some databases, you can't tell the difference unless you go look at the individual web page for that enhancer gene link. If you go and download the bulk data, it's just sort of dumped out to you in a spreadsheet or text file of enhancers and their linked genes without even tissue-specific information. And another issue is that enhancer gene link databases often do not have any score or p-value for the enhancer gene link itself, which makes it really hard for the investigator to evaluate the quality of the links. And in the rare case that there is a score, it is not necessarily even that interpretable uh, it may not follow a statistical distribution. So while you may, you know, be able to tell that probably a higher score is better, it can be difficult to know, like, what is high enough? Um, is 3 a good score? Is 37? Maybe at 100? Um, you know, if it's bounded by 0 and infinity, it's sort of difficult to tell when, when you have um, a, a high, a score that really is high. And more importantly, there has been no process of statistical validation to show that a higher score necessarily correlates with an enhancer gene link being more likely to be a true link. So while there has been a lot of good work done on trying to generate enhancer gene links, there's certainly room for improvement. So the motivation for this body of work basically springs from the desire to contribute improved information on enhancer gene links. 
and to be able to co incorporate that information into GWAS or other variant association studies. So I started by creating my own collection of enhancer gene links based on publicly available data, which is the Peregrine Enhancer Gene Link beta Database, which will shortly be available online via pantherdb.org. But then I was also really concerned with making sure that we had some way to evaluate the quality of the enhancer gene links in Peregrine. I wanted our enhancer gene links to have a statistically validated score that we could show was associated with enhancer gene links being real. So that led to us using machine learning as a way to create and validate cell type specific prediction models to generate scores. And then we got to thinking, maybe we can pool some of this information we learned from the cell type specific models and make a better pooled model for a more powerful approach. And of course, the inspiration for getting all of these enhancer gene links was to be able to use them in a disease context. So as a first application, we want to incorporate the enhancer gene link information into pathway enrichment analysis. So let's jump right in into the Peregrine Enhancer Gene Link database. So uh, just quickly, Peregrine is actually a type of falcon, if you were wondering what that, what that means. Um, and it's probably the most famous kind of falcon, actually. So in, this, in here, though, it stands for predicted by experimental results, enhancer gene relationships illustrated by a nexus of evidence because that's what the crux of the database is, enhancer gene links backed by experimental evidence. So the first question that I always try to ask myself when working on making something new is, why do we need this? How is it different than what's already out there? Firstly, uh, the enhancer set is much more comprehensive than the other enhancer gene link databases that incorporate these kinds of experiments. You can see that when we compare the Peregrine enhancer set, to the enhancer sets of Haster and Genehancer. The majority of those enhancers are found within the Peregrine set, but that many of the enhancers in the Peregrine set are not found in either of these databases. So from the beginning, we're examining more enhancers for links to target genes and providing more enhancer information. But the crucial differences um, are that there will be enhancer gene links available in completely cell type specific context, uh, that will have more assays and information contributing to generating the links, avail links available for bulk download. And probably the most important difference is that there will be a cell type specific statistically validated score for the enhancer gene links. So I told you that there are other databases that provide predicted enhancer gene links, but sometimes they actually do not score the links. PACER uh, just provides a few examples of actual links that their database successfully predicted as evidence that their predictions are good. Um, while there is occasionally an effort to quantify the amount of evidence supporting an enhancer gene link, um, such as is done in a gene enhancer, uh, these scores are arbitrarily computed not according to a statistical distribution and do not offer a validated measure of confidence or strength of association. Therefore, even for the predicted enhancer gene link databases we do have, there's no score to help us exclude false positives. And when there is a score, we have no idea if it's even indicative of confidence of association. The scores are usually formulated mostly by intuition, but we have no idea how many of these links are actually true or false. So maybe the most important difference between Peregrine enhancer gene links and those generated by others is the fact that we will provide a tissue-specific score of how confident we are that the predicted link is true. Instead of trying to generate my own set of enhancers, I just actually took enhancer gene sets from ENCODE's uh, catalog of regulatory, candidate regulatory elements, Ensemble's regulatory build, uh, VISTA's set of enhancers experimentally validated in transgenic mice, and Phantom 5 enhancers predicted by analysis of enhancer RNA. And here are just a few metrics of the entire Peregrine enhancer set. You can see that the majority of enhancers come from the ENCODE catalog of candidate regulatory elements. And you can also see that with the exception of the small amount of enhancers coming from VISTA, they are on average a few hundred base pairs long, which is about how long we believe most enhancers to be. So our overall average length of 422 base pairs is probably actually pretty cr close to reality. So once I had my enhancer set, I collected EQTL data from GTEx, uh, ChiaPet 5C and HiC data from ENCODE, 
and hierarchical TAD data from psychic. And I'm just going to go over each of these experiments quickly to explain why they're relevant to enhance your gene links. CHIAPAT stands for Chromatin Interaction Analysis by Paradigm Tag Sequencing. You may remember that in the beginning of the talk, I said that enhancers are thought to upregulate their target genes through recruitment of transcriptional machinery. Uh, in order to do this, they need to come into close proximity of the promoters of their target genes via chromatin looping. Active enhancers are typically associated with H3K27 acetylation marks concurrent with the presence of RNA polymerase 2, which is just the polymerase responsible for mRNA transcription of genes. So in order to assay this function of enhancer regulation of target genes, we needed data from an experiment that could detect genome-wide looping interactions at high resolution. So CHIAPET is an assay that is capable of assessing DNA-DNA interaction frequency through the targeting of DNA sequences that are bound to a specific protein of interest. The protein of interest in this case was RNA polymerase II, which is pulled down from cross-linked fragmented chimeric DNA fragments with an antibody specific to RNA polymerase II. This assay allowed me to examine DNA-DNA interactions between DNA fragments that were bound to RNA polymerase II. So over here on the right, um, we have a circos plot uh, that I just pulled from the web to kind of give a visual for how this works, where if you look closely, you can see that each color is labeled with a different chromosome number, um, and then the sex chromosomes up here. And so each strand st uh, connects two pieces of DNA. They could be on the same chromosome, or they can be, you know, on a, on a totally different chromosome from far away. And each end is just denoting uh, which part of that chromosome is physically interacting with the other by uh, mediation of that target protein. So in our case, um, that target protein is RNA polymerase II. So we're looking for each, uh, each partner, each piece of DNA that's bound to it to see um, if there are enhancer genes in there. So I used the Mango pipeline to process the raw data taken from ENCODE and restricted to results that achieved a p-value of no higher than 0.05. Then I searched the fragmented regions for genes and enhancers. I then looked for DNA-DNA interactions where one interaction partner contained an enhancer and the other interaction partner contained a promoter. When that happened, I recorded it as evidence of an enhancer gene link. So that is how we used Chiapet. Uh, so we also incorporated EQTL, and EQTL, uh, which stands for Expression Quantitative Trait Locus, is a locus, and in the data I collected, it's actually a single SNP, and probably most commonly is a single SNP, that explains a fraction of the genetic variance of a gene expression phenotype. Standard EQTL analysis involves a direct association test between markers of genetic variation with gene expression levels typically measured in tens or hundreds of, of uh, individuals. So over here on the right, we have kind of um, a really classic example of what you might see. So um, at, the, at the EQTL, at the locus, um, you have a SNP, and if it's homozygous reference allele, maybe you see this amount of gene expression. And when it's heterozygous, um, you see like a decreased sort of a medium amount of expression. And when it's homozygous alternate, you see a, a significantly lower amount of expression. So this is sort of um, the results that you'd wanna see if you were trying to show um, that the loci was associated with changing the gene expression of the gene. And so here's just, um, another depiction of that where maybe this is the SNP and depending on if it's, you know, GG or it's heterozygous AG or it's homozygous AA, you see a clear difference in gene expression. So that's the sort of data that we're looking at. And while the majority of GWAS variants are located within non-coding regions, it's believed their effects are likely to be via the regulation of gene expression. So EQTL analyses may be able to identify a link between the expression of a target gene and variations within an enhancer, uh, which suggests that EQTL located within enhancers could be perhaps our best available assay for forming enhancer gene links in a tissue-specific context. 
So we reasoned that if an EQTL was located within an enhancer, that information could link that enhancer to the gene that the EQTL was shown to explain variation in that gene's expression. So sort of going back to this figure, it's like if this red SNP, if you imagine that, you know, it's right smack in the middle of an enhancer, and it's shown here to significantly alter gene expression based on um, the genotype of that SNP, you would essentially have directly linked that enhancer by way of its EQTL to the gene that it was shown to regulate. So that was the sort of links that um, we captured here. And although enhancers can act on their target genes from great distances, the probability of regulatory events is thought to drop considerably with increasing genomic distance between the enhancer and gene. And we think that a megabase is sort of the, um, a megabase of separation is probably on the more extreme side. So we decided to incorporate topologically associated domain data from HiC experiments. And so that's what TAD stands for. Um, TADs are spatial units of spatial subdivisions of chromosome where chromatin contacts within a TAD are favored, while interactions between neighboring TADs are largely prevented. So TADs are continuous regions of DNA spanning a few hundred kilobases to a few megabases, probably about one megabase on average, um, that have been shown to be folded upon themselves into local compartments and facilitate high number of DNA-DNA interactions. So here you kind of see the flat linear version of how we tend to think of DNA and everything in the green shaded triangle being a TAD. But then up here, you can kind of get a sense for how when it's talking about compartmental, um, compartmentalization and how within this TAD, you know, even this piece of DNA and this piece of DNA that looked far away when, when we're viewing um, DNA linear in a linear fashion, which is not how it exists in the cell, you see here that um, here they are quite close, and so just to give an illustration of how um, it is folded in within itself and, and how those contacts could be facilitated easier when DNA is in the same tab. And it's believed that the majority of enhancer gene regulatory interactions are found within the same tab. Um, so due to the relationship that TAD boundaries have in facilitating or preventing enhancer gene regulatory interactions, we decided to form a link between an enhancer and a gene if they were located in the same TAD in a specific cell type. Although it is believed that the majority of enhancer gene regulatory interactions are found within the same TAD, that's not to insinuate that every enhancer and gene within the same TAD have a direct regulatory relationship. So uh, in this figure, for example, if the green ovals uh, represent enhancers and the blue arrows represent genes, that although there are many regulatory relationships within the TAD, it's not to say that every enhancer is interacting with every gene or vice versa. So um, given that we know that by including links formed from this data, we're including many false positives uh, because we know that they they are not all necessarily interacting with each other, even if some of them are. So to mitigate this effect, we decided not to include links formed from TAD boundary data unless the link was supported by at least one other experimental assay. So in this context, TAD boundary data instead function in a supportive role among the other evidences and not as an assay that was deemed appropriate to utilize on its own to form enhanced gene links. So enhancer gene links were not recorded if the only evidence supporting them was that they were located within the same TAD. This assay may only support enhancer gene links that were already supported by other experimental evidence. And although we know that chromatin contacts within a TAD are favored as opposed to contacts between chromatin found in separate TADs, there are many possible combinations of which genetic elements are interacting within the same TAD, and it would be desirable to know more about what is happening within the TAD. In recent years, there has been a significant effort to design algorithms to elucidate this hierarchical or intradomain structure of TADs. And in December 2017, Rod et al. Pu published their computational model, Psychic, to call hierarchical TADs. They analyzed HiC data to identify enriched DNA, DNA interactions, which I was then able to use to map promoter enhancer interactions from my set. So among 
the hierarchical TAD data, if an enhancer was found to be physically interacting with the genes promoter, we, we did record that as an enhancer gene link. So that kind of data wouldn't just be this large green triangle. It would be um, like a triangle showing, a smaller triangle within it showing that this enhancer is interacting with this gene, you know, and maybe a bigger one over here that hopefully could capture, capture this. So um, that was hierarchical TAD data from Psychic that we were able to use to generate links as well. So here you can get a sense for how many enhancer gene links were found across all four of these assays, both from the Venn diagram and the table. Now remember when looking at the table that the links in each assay may also be included in the number of links for another assay. Many enhancer gene links are supported by multiple assays, which is why the lines in the table do not sum to 890,403, which was the total number of enhancer gene links found overall. You can see a little better in the Venn diagram how many links are exclusive to one assay versus uh, the links that are that are uh, shared by that are supported by multiple assays. Uh, which I and I think that the Venn diagram is probably the best representation of the numbers for that reason. And you can see here uh, again that TAD the TAD boundary data where just because a gene and an enhancer were found in the same TAD, if that was the only supporting evidence, we did not um, include those. And so that's why this has a zero. But these other assays, which we deemed stronger evidence, may um, may have links that are only supported by them. But clearly, you know, we have many, many links that are supported by different combinations, um, which is great to see. So how will the enhancer gene links be made available? Um, so there's several ways I'm gonna go over. This first one is the gene, uh, is, is on the gene list. So this is the Panther, this is the Panther website at pantherdb.org. So on the homepage, you can upload a list of genes um, or you can upload a VCF file of SNPs, and um, if you if you process these, um, you will then be presented a gene list. And so this is a really small one of just three genes, but um, enhancer data will be shown in the final column. And and what this is is just um, for each gene, it gives you a list of all of the enhancers that were associated through Peregrine data to the given gene. So that's one way. Um, also, on the gene detail page, if you're looking at a specific um, gene and you click on it, you got this page and it has a lot of good data, um, but now it will also have this section called enhancers, and if you click on this link, you will get a list of all the enhancers that are associated with this gene, and um, you'll get a list of, you know, all the supporting data in the tissue type, uh, the p-values, all that good stuff. And then we also have the enhancer detail page, which uh, if you click on a certain enhancer, you'll get the enhancer ID, its location, its original source, um, and a list of all the genes that it was associated with. And again, you can see, um, you'll, you'll get the tissue, the assay, the p-value, and if it's an EQTL evidence, you will also get the um, SNP name as well. So, lots of different ways. So, we don't want to just provide enhancer gene link information without trying to ascertain the quality of these links. So, how do we know which links are real? Um, you know, in reality, we do not know, but as in much of science, the aim is to try and approximate the confidence with which an investigator could <coughs> treat the enhancer gene link data as true. So this brings us back to the idea of generating a statistically validated score for our enhancer gene links. And of course, the million dollar question is how? How am I gonna generate this score? And that takes us right into machine learning because I am seeking to apply a machine learning approach to predicting the links that are true in my data set. So now I'm just going to give a quick overview of machine learning as it pertains to this work. So the output of this problem is simple. 
Given some enhancer gene links, I want to predict if they are true or false. So that's a two-class classification problem. We're trying to classify the links as either true or false, real or not real, however you want to think about it. Um, so in order for this machine learning approach to work, we need a positive and negative class of real links to function as the two classes. The positive class is true links, and the negative class would be links that we know are not true. And if I can provide my algorithm many examples of true and not true enhancer gene links, it can learn how to predict which are most likely to be true given a new set of predicted enhancer gene links. So let me briefly outline two class classification prediction in this context. There are two classes, true enhancer gene links and false enhancer gene links. We need to teach the machine how to distinguish between them with an algorithm. So we do that by providing a set of true and false enhancer gene links and characterize them with features, um, so like independent variables basically, to help the algorithm to distinguish between true and false links. We can then ask the algorithm to predict which new links are true and with what probability, essentially confidence. In order for that to work, we need to provide informative features and we need to provide as many positive and negative class members as possible so the algorithm can train on them. So how will we get these? The positive class needs to be a set of enhancer gene links that we know are true. And the negative class would be a set of enhancer gene links that we know are not true. How can we get such a set? To start with the positive class, um, unfortunately, there's no central repository for experimentally validated enhancer gene links. There's no gold standard enhancer gene link database, so we can't pull from anything like that. So I turn to the literature. And after combing through many, many papers, I have amassed a set of published studies that experimentally validate a given enhancer regulating a given gene and a given cell type. So these are not predicted links, these are experimentally validated, but there are a lot of cell types out there. So it takes a lot of papers to provide a set of experimentally validated enhancer gene links for each cell type to function as our positive class. So I decided to start with papers in HEPG2, which is a liver carcinoma cell line, since I just happened to find more papers in that cell line at first. Um, but initially I met with a lot of hesitation on using published work to construct my enhancer gene link positive class in HEPG2 because no two papers are the same, both in terms of the strength and rigor of their results or the set of experiments they chose to employ. So I created this rubric to provide transparency into what precisely was judged strong enough evidence to land an enhancer gene link into the positive class. And we aren't going to read through all of these here, but the gist of them all is that the experimenters needed to show a statistically significant difference in target gene expression between the wild type enhancer and either a mutation or deletion of all or part of it to be accepted into the positive class. Okay, so what about the negative set? Um, so people don't generally publish with the intent of convincing us of their negative results. So um, we didn't think that null results were rigorous enough to contribute to the negative set. So we couldn't just use the same approach of gathering from the literature. Uh, so we used a different approach. We, we accessed chromatin accessibility experimental data for given cell types and thought that we could reasonably conclude that enhancers are not active if they're located in chromatin that's physically inaccessible. So from those data, we can generate a negative class for um, each cell type. So now that we have a positive and a negative set of enhancer gene links, we can move on toward using machine learning to create and validate cell type specific prediction models. HEPG2 is an immortalized cell line consisting of human liver carcinoma cells derived from the liver tissue of a Caucasian male who had a well-differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is actually the fifth most common cancer worldwide. So I mentioned before that in order for, uh, for the machine to be able to learn how to differentiate between true and false enhancers, we, enhancer gene links, excuse me, we need to be able to provide informative features. So features are a way for the algorithm to see the links, um, descriptors that hopefully will be different between the positive and the negative class. And so here on the right is um, a classic schematic of how 
uh, we believe enhancers regulate their target genes. And so pretty much all of the features listed on the left, you can, you can directly find in this figure because we really wanted the biology of the problem to inform the feature set. So uh, some of the features are specific only to the enhancer or only to the gene, and some are specific to both simultaneously. So an example of that is H3K27 acetylation is uh, an active mark that we would look for at the enhancer. And so is H3K4 monomethylation um, versus H3K4 trimethylation is something that we would expect to see at the promoter of a gene that's being upregulated by an enhancer. Um, and so we might also expect to see a little H3K27 acetylation at the promoter um, from these two coming into contact and um, histone acetyl transferases uh, maybe still being active when they're close together. So P300 is um, a very common histone acetyl transferase, which is, pro which is actually responsible for placing these active acetylation marks. So we did look for binding of that on the enhancer as well. We also just recorded um, whether the enhancer was intronic to the target gene or not, because sometimes enhancers regulate from within the intron of the, of the very gene that they're regulating, which is an interesting phenomenon. And then um, we also recorded EQTL in two ways. Uh, the first is a Z-score, which is just a measure of statistical significance. And again, we mapped the EQTLs uh, to EQTL that were residing literally within an enhancer. And um, the gene is uh, already provided by the EQTL data itself. And then we also recorded it in terms of effect size. So um, whether or not it's statistically significant, how much did it change? How much did it influence gene expression? So that's effect size. And then we also just recorded a yes or no if the enhancer happened to be, um, or if the target gene happened to be the nearest gene or not. So those were the features we provided for HEP-G2, the main features. And so um, we really didn't know what kind of model we should look at because we didn't really know what the boundary of the two classes would look like. So if you just imagine the red and the blue to be true and false or you know, whatever um, way you want to think about the two classes. Here we have um, illustrations where two classes are um, portrayed as a, in, the, in a two-dimensional space between two features. Now, obviously, we have more than two features, but just to give an idea. So this is an example where um, the boundary is linear. So if you just drew like a straight line, you could, you could get really good separation between the two classes. So we didn't know, should we use a linear model? Will it look like something like that? Or will it be something like this, where there is really good separation between the classes, but not by drawing a straight line, you're not going to be able to draw a straight line of any sort here that does a good job of um, capturing that difference. But if you were to sort of be able to create two um, blobs here, if you were able to use a radial boundary, you could do it. So we sort of tried a little bit of everything. Um, we tried logistic regression, a support vector machine with a radial kernel, we also did elastic net and random forest. And so in order to judge which of those models worked best, um, we, we used validation. So when validating your model, the gold standard is to use your data to train the model and then to pull some completely unrelated outside data to test your model on. And what you're testing is how well the model works on data in general, that you haven't, just to make sure that you haven't simply created a model that's only going to predict well on the exact data um, that it trained on, which is obviously not terribly useful. Um, but often you may not be able to pull in outside data, and this was our case. So in such cases, you can use some form of cross-validation, which is a method where the data is, the data that you gathered is actually split into K, equally sized folds. So in this figure, uh, it would be split into five folds, you can see that each, like the bar is all the data, and so it's split into five pieces that are equally sized. And so one fold acts as the test data while the model, while the model is trained, so it's held off, um, it's not used to train the model, it's just pulled to the side. 
And in the meantime, the, the other K minus one, the other four um, folds of the data are, are combined and treated as the training set. So the model trains on the training set, and then afterwards you test on the test data and see how well does it perform on data that it's never seen before. And so you do this K times so that each fold of the data gets a turn to be the test data. And then at the end of that, you can average the performance of all K models to get a more stable estimate of prediction performance. And you can even repeat this process R times, which means that you're now iterating over R unique versions of splitting the data into K folds. So even if you're splitting the data into five pieces here, it's at random. So if you were to then to do it again, um, each set would have at least slightly different members. So by doing it R times, uh, R unique versions of splitting the data, you can average the prediction performance metrics at the end of that to get an even better estimate of prediction performance. So that's what we did. Uh, we used repeated k-fold validation and we split our data into three folds since it's only 343 data points um, which is not terribly large we don't want to split it into smaller pieces than that and then we did um, anywhere from five to fifty repeats of this to average the prediction performance of uh, various models that we tried so um, by analyzing the prediction performance, um, we can then get an idea of what is best suited to our data problem. So the measure of prediction performance we used is the AUC, which stands for area under curve. And so in this um, case, the curve is the ROC, which is the receiver operating curve. And um, it balances the true positive rate against the false positive rate. And so if you had, and so the area under the curve is literally the, uh, the amount of area of the square that you could draw that would still be under the curve. So with the blue here, you can see you've almost got 100%. It's probably like 98 or something. Um, if you had an AUC of one, it would be, it would, predict perfectly every time. And if you had um, an AUC on this dotted line, this is the 50% mark. So this essentially would be like no better than a coin toss. So obviously you want your model to be to the left of that. So um, this is just an example of, of how different lines, how it could end up being. And you just want it to be as close to one as possible. And obviously a lot of that um, depends on how how separable the classes are. So again, we had no idea what that would look like, but the the blue is an extremely ideal scenario. But even red or green would be good too. So um, actually one of the underlying assumptions of using cross-validation to get a good estimate of prediction performance is that the data points should be pretty independent of each other. And so in our case, since each data point is actually an enhancer gene link, uh, if there are enhancer gene links with either um, an enhancer or a gene in common, those data points are going to have about half of their features being identical. If, they, if uh, there's two links that have the same enhancer, at least all the features that are enhancer features are going to be the same and vice versa for the genes. So that would kind of, they wouldn't be too independent at that point. So what we can do to help this is essentially something uh, called blocking where we essentially force related data points to always be in the same fold of data when the data is cut so that the model is not learning from data points that are highly related to data points in the test data, which could certainly result in a higher prediction performance estimate, a higher AUC than what is actually real. So uh, we did that, and then we looked at the average AUCs to see what type of statistical model we should use. And actually, they all did pretty well. Um, here we have a table of, in HEPG2, we did not actually have to block by enhancer because it turned out that um, all 343 of our observation points had unique enhancers, so there was um, no need for blocking, but, but there were some links that did have their gene in common, so we blocked by gene, which is to say that we just made sure that links that had the same gene were in the same fold of data at all times during cross-validation. So 
with that, um, with with a random forest uh, uh, constraint to make it so that the classes are balanced, we have a mean AUC of 90, 0.91 for elastic net uh, 0.91 and for logistic regression 0.85. So we selected random forest for further analysis. And just to um, give some sort of visualization of the final HEPG2 prediction model, um, here is the feature list in terms of mean decrease in the Gini coefficient. And so the Gini coefficient is, um, this is just a measure of variable importance. So, uh, you can see, for example, that the biggest mean decrease is the variable nearest. So nearest um, is a very important variable, and so is the z-score for EQTL, and so is whether the gene was intronic, or I'm sorry, whether the enhancer was intronic to its target gene. Um, there are also some interaction terms here. We actually did create interaction terms from that feature list I showed you. Um, which were uh, interactions between variables that were just for enhancers or just for genes, we would uh, create interaction terms so that the interaction term was then a feature that gave information on both the enhancer and the gene. And then we also have an interaction term that is uh, the EQTL Z score interacting with the EQTL uh, effect size, which was a true interaction term. Average looking like, what was the dispersion? Because it would be pretty bad if there were, um, you know, maybe a, a lot of AUCs really high, but then, you know, there were, a, there were a few down really, really low too. So we wanted to see how consistent it was. And so here's just a plot of the AUCs from 30 repeats of threefold cross-validation with gene blocking um, in the random forest model. And so that's a total of 90 AUCs you're seeing here. And so the mean is 0.91, and you can see from the chart that the median's probably 91, maybe 92 as well. And that it never really, that none of the AUCs ever really go bo below probably 0.79, which is reassuring to us as well. So once we had these really cool results in, our, uh, in the liver carcinoma cell line, the next natural question was, well, what about other cell types how will this look in a completely different cell line? And so we then investigated um, another cell line. Uh, HCT116 is a colorectal carcinoma cell line. And so we gathered papers from, from that cell line as well and uh, also gathered features from the same sources so that these models would be comparable. Um, and this this uh, features list is exactly the same as the one for HEPG2, with the one exception that um, P300 binding data, uh, this little histonocetal transferase right here, was, was not available in HCT116, so we had to drop it. But otherwise, all of these features are the same as what we saw in HEPG2. And so again, the models all performed really well, and um, Random Forest, uh, just pulled very, very slightly ahead and of the others, and so we decided to use that for further analysis. But you can see here that um, in the HCT116 data, we actually did block by gene, and then we blocked by enhancer because there were, uh, in our 343 training set, there were links that shared, that shared common genes, and then there were other links that shared common enhancers. So we had to block both ways, but um, you can see that it's, it still performs really well. And this is, again, threefold cross-validation repeated 30 times. Um, and this was done with benchmarking. So these are um, straight apples to apples comparisons. And so here's uh, the same kind of figure, the mean decrease in the Gini coefficient. Um, you can see that 
you know, the, the variable importance list looks a little bit different, but there's nothing here that wouldn't be, that would be considered surprising, I think. Um, so it looks like the most important variable to this model was um, H3K4 monomethylation interacting with H3K4 trimethylation. And, and uh, the monomethylation is an active enhancer mark, and the trimethylation is the, is the, um, the active, the promoter mark. So, so this variable is now um, giving, providing information on the enhancer and the gene. So, um, and you can also see that the model methylation by itself is, is also very important um, and so on. And so here they are. And uh, similarly, we looked at the dispersion. So on top is when we're blocking by gene and on the bottom is when we're blocking by enhancers. And they actually both happen to have the same mean AUC. Um, it looks like the when blocking by gene, we have a little bit more dispersion. It can go all the way down to 0.8, and we're blocking by enhancers. Um, it's a little bit tighter. There's one outlier that maybe is around 0.81 or 2, but for the most part, everything stays within 0.85 or above. So that's pretty cool. And so I think naturally the next step is to, you know, you want to compare these models. Um, they both performed really well uh, and with similar features data. So let's see, how, how can we compare them? Um, so definitely we can uh, look at and are curious to look at the difference between which features were important to which models. So on the left we have HEPG2 and on the right we have HCT116. Um, so it's interesting to kind of look and see, given those two different training sets, what um, variables seem to be most important. And we can also look at prediction performance, um, like the mean AUC after blocking, which was 0.91 for HEPG2 and 0.93 for HCT116. So they're pretty similar. Um, but I think that maybe the most interesting way to compare these two models is to actually um, see how well they are able to predict on each other's data. And what I mean by that is we have a random forest model that was trained in um, co uh, colorectal carcinoma cell line, HCT116, and um, learned everything it knows about what true enhancer gene links look like from that data. And what if we then fed it test data that was from the liver cancer cell line, the HEPG2, uh, line, how well did it perform? And it actually performed really well. It had an AUC of 0.87. And so we did the same uh, the other way around where we took the final random forest model that was trained in HEPG2 and we introduced the um, colorectal carcinoma cell line and saw how well was it then able to use information it learned from a liver cancer cell line and apply it to new data, even though that new data is a totally different cell line. and um, performed even slightly better, AUC 0.89. So that was really impressive um, to us. And maybe at first kind of surprising, you know, these cell lines are really different. Liver cancer and um, colorectal carcinoma um, are pretty different. Uh, liver and colon are not that similar as far as I know. So at first this was pretty surprising and I got to thinking, how is this possible? How can this be? And, and then I realized maybe it's not surprising at all because even though the first thing that you're really taught about enhancer function is it's cell type specific, cell type specific, cell type specific. And anything you want to say about an enhancer, the first question is, well, what's the, what's the setting? Which cell type are we talking about? And their activity is very cell type specific. Um, and which genes they regulate, or if they regulate at all, is very cell type specific. But the mechanism of enhancer activity is probably not cell type specific. Um, for example, when we think of this, when we think of this drawing, um, this is not how in, we think enhancers work in liver or in the brain or in the heart. This is how we think that enhancers uh, regulate genes in any cell. So. We, we believe that enhancer gene links function in a certain way, no matter what cell type they're in. And actually, it's the value for each feature that's cell type specific. So by that, I mean that 
I don't think anyone is going to argue that H3K27 acetylation is active, is, an, is associated with active enhancers in um, one cell type, but not in another. So really at that point, then what you're looking at is in a given cell type, is there an H3K27 acetylation mark or not? So it's the value of the feature. It's not whether this is an important feature. It's we know it's an important feature. Now we have to look at the cell type of interest to see is is that feature present? Is that value there? So that would explain why even a model trained in a liver cancer cell line would still do a really good job of predicting true links in a colorectal cancer cell line because if the model is able to learn and regardless of which regardless of which cell line it learned in, if it was able to learn something accurate about how true links look, then it will be able to apply that information to an outside cell line just fine. And so that's what we think that we are looking at here. So the next um, kind of thought that arose from that was, can we then use enhancer gene link data from multiple cell types to train a single model if you know, if the mechanism is consistent, then can we take advantage of that um, and sort of pool our data to make a, a bigger, um, or not a bigger model necessarily, but a, um, a data a model that has more data points to train on. So I believe that we can uh, in the form of a pooled model, which I'll talk about now. So I think that the way we can do this is we can use uh, the features we would use for a pooled model would be all the features that are <clears throat> that are common to both cell lines. So that is basically the full list minus P300 because remember that was not available in the colon line. So we'd have to drop that. Um, and so... Again, we definitely don't want to do anything to violate the cell type specificity of the enhancer action, the enhancer function. So um, we, for our positive set, we, uh, and for each observation, it will be important that um, it's clear what cell type they came from. And so we'll have the, for the positive training set, we just, you know, combine the cell type specific enhancer gene links from both cell types that were already in the positives. Um, so that's simple. But for the negative training set, we have to be careful because we don't want to um, muddy the signal. We really, if there's a link that's negative in one cell, but not in the other, that cell would not, that link rather, would not be suitable for giving us information on enhancer gene link activity because, uh, you know, it's, it's not consistent across. So we really only want to be looking at negative links that are negative in both cell types, um, just so that we can remain consistent. And so um, since about half of the, since there are about the same number of positive links in each, from each cell line, we would just look at all the pooled negatives um, from both that are negative in both cell lines, and we would just take a random sample um, where half of them were from HEPT2 and half of them were from HCT116, and that, and that would give us our negative set. But again, we'd really want to make sure that um, we were only using links that were negative in both so that um, we, we weren't using information appropriately, inappropriately. And we can then take test data from a third completely unrelated cell type to validate our model in addition to using cross-validation. And that will kind of, um, and that will kind of show uh, if it works that by looking at data from multiple cell types, we can generate a model with better ability to correctly classify enhancer gene links. So that even though a model could be trained on these two cell types, that if it can then perform really well in a test in test data that's from a third totally unrelated cell line, it kind of shows that um, this helps to generate a model with good ability to classify enhancer gene links correctly, um, regardless of what cell type they, they are in. Um, so yeah, that we can, we can show that uh, it has ability to predict enhancer gene links in very different cell types um, from the one that it was trained in, which is, will be an important 
thing. So once we were able to um, come up with these final scores for the links, we would like to incorporate them in a real world application. So we want to incorporate enhancer gene link scores into pathway enrichment analysis. So uh, when you think back to the example that I brought up about, we found um, a GWAS variant that was significantly associated with the disease, and we know that it's an enhancer, but we don't really need to know where to go from there. Um, you know, once if we have enhancer gene leak data on that enhancer, that's no longer true. We can now um, apply that information, we can apply uh, that functional information. So, in Panther, um, there is on the home page, which is here pictured, you can actually do um, statistical enrichment on if you were to upload your GWAS results and you can do statistical enrichment. And we want to be able to, uh, right now it only takes um, variants that are called to genes into account, but we want to then be able to expand that to take, to take into account variants that are called to enhancers if we, if we have information on what that enhancer's function is on what its target genes are. So how can we incorporate enhancer gene link data into pathway enrichment analysis? So this is what, um, you know, a, a pathway looks like right now where it's a bunch of different proteins, i.e. genes um, that are interacting together and the enrichment analysis is done at the pathway level. So it's looking to see if statistically significant signal from the GWAS is, um, is enriched in any certain pathway. And right now, again, we can only take uh, variants that are called to genes to be able to do that. But if you can imagine that in each pathway that we look at right now, that's just a bunch of, like a web of genes that sort of in the background, um, there's this additional information that ties enhancers to each gene. And, you know, we want to look at expanding the pathway to essentially include any enhancer that has been shown to uh, regulate a target gene. So basically an enhancer would become a member of the same pathway as its target gene, and that would be uh, some function of the score uh, because, you know, we're not 100% certain on any of these, so uh, it would be as some function of the score we would incorporate the variants called to the enhancer and their disease-associated signal uh, along with the gene called variants to be able to do pathway analysis. And we think that that will be very, that, that will be very helpful to incorporating this gargantuan amount of disease-associated variants that are in enhancers and we don't know what else to do with them. If we can pull them back into the picture, that it will be very helpful. And that's all I have. Thank you.